Hello and welcome once again to Stretch Drive. I'm Greg Blanchard along with Lloyd McDonald and this week on the program we're going to feature a story on the fate of Port Elgin Raceway. In our driver profile this week we meet Charlottetown Rangeman Lenny Myers. As well we'll have lots of race highlights to show you including racing from Exhibition Park Raceway in St. John. This and a whole lot more and it's coming up next here on Stretch Drive. <laughs> This evening's show, I would like to uh, first thank everyone who mailed in entries in contest number one and called in their entries in contest number two. The question in contest number one was who is the fastest age pacer here in the Maritimes this year? And of course, the correct answer was Nuclear Flash. Uh, we had our draw here earlier this evening, and the winner was Ernie Dunsford of Charlottetown. And Ernie, you can pick up that old home week special Thursday evening at the Charlottetown Driving Park. And the winner of contest number two, that calling contest, was Marlene Pigeon of Kensington. And she knew the correct answer to the question, what was the mile when J.K. Beauty set the track record at the Charlottetown Driving Park back in 1991? And that, of course, was 155-1. and one. Congratulations to Marlene Pigeon. And uh, Marlene, you can also pick up your copy of the Best of Old Home Week uh, Thursday night at the Charlottetown Driving Park. Now we're going to take a look at race number four from Thursday evening at Truro Raceway. It featured a nine-horse field, and uh, island-owned Kaman Comanche seemed to be the favorite here. Come on, Comanche uh, is off a win in 204 last time out, uh, winner by six. Darren Trainer of Charlottetown owns this one, and a horse that looks like he's improving with each uh, start. Number seven, Swinging Wave, will also be good in here. Uh, Phil Pinkney gets the drive. The seven post uh, may hurt a little bit, but if Swinging Wave can get up into the action early, uh, should be a factor as well. Lee's lad, Norgale Trooper, come on, Comanche. Swinging wave, Clonmel Superior and Trish's Gold. They are off, and as they leave the gate, Nor Gale Trooper away looking for the lead. Gas pedal gets away second up on the outside. Swinging wave is hustled out third. They race into the first turn on their way by the opening eighth. Nor Gale Trooper coming away on top. Swinging wave up on the limb gets away second. Gas pedal is third on the outside racing fourth. That is Clonmel Superior in along the rail and pacing in five is Ginger's Night Charm. Taking a look from six as they head down the back stretch is Trish's Gold. They race into the turn. Single file as they approach the three eighths. Out front leading the way. Swinging wave only momentarily as Norgale Trooper moves back to reclaim the lead. Or Gale Trooper now by a length and a half. Swinging wave second. Gas pedal is coming first up third. Out the rail fourth. Clonmel Superior. In along the rail and racing five. That's Ginger's Night Charm. Come on Comanche on the move on the outside from six. 29 and three was the opening quarter. They move past the halfway marker. Nor Gale Trooper by a length and a half. Gas pedal on the outside is racing second. Third in the pocket. That swinging wave getting a second over trip. Racing in four as they dip into the bend. That's come on, Comanche. Fifth in along the rail is Clonmel Superior. Ginger's Night Charm from six. Kill Karen Key on the outside has seven. Racing in eight is Trish's Gold. And lagging behind the field. That is Shaylee's Lad. Up the back stretch. 101 and two was the half. Norgale Troopers the one to catch. Come on, Comanche. Out there. Three wide. Now moving up to confront Norgale Trooper. Also on the move. Three wide into three. That's Kill Karen Key swinging wave down inside is locked in fourth. Gas pedal on the outside, racing in five, three wide is Clonmel Superior six. A tight bunch as they move past the seven eights, one three three and one three quarters. Come on, Comanche in the center, a slight lead. Norgale Trooper at the rail is second. Three wide and racing third 
as they drive through the lane is Kill Karen Key. Come on, Comanche. Come on, Comanche getting up to win it. Finishing second is Norgale Trooper, and the show spot goes to Swinging Wave. Come on, Comanche, and Gary McDonald getting the job done in there, Greg. That's two in a row now for Come On Comanche, and uh, owner Darren Trainer must uh, be pretty happy with his new acquisition. 204 and 2 this time out, and uh, this three year old son of Redskin looks like he's a good one. We're going to switch over now to the Charlottetown Driving Park, race number seven on Thursday evening's card. It featured a two to $2,500 claimer, and uh, Woodmere Chipper in here is coming off a win. Looks to be the early favorite, Greg. Woodmere Chipper will be one to watch in here. This is a very competitive bunch, uh, one of the best on the grounds. And Woodmere Chipper, again, uh, will be one of the favorites in there from the four post, a winner by eight and a half last time out in the off track and uh, should be tough again. I think number eight, Conoco Victory, will also be tough. Jody Hennessy, who is just back home from uh, St. John and has been picking up some drives here on a regular basis, will uh, have a good shot in here from the eight post. Race seven, top of the stretch, has one Shugo I go. Two knots for the banker, three power boom, four Woodmere Chipper, five Dusty Lane Maggie, six provisions to win, seven outside is Woodmere Crunch, trailing horse eight. That is Canico Victory. Here they come. Saying Hugo Igo up the rail, Conoco Victory, Power Boom up on the outside. They drive into the first turn, going to the eighth mark. Hugo Igo showing the way out front. Up on the outside, going three wide is a Woodmere Chipper. Between horses is Power Boom. They are three wide up front as they go battling for the lead. Farthest on the outside, a Woodmere Chipper is now making front. Hugo Igo looks set at second, Kenneco Victory Racing third, Power Boom takes a spot at the rail and four, Nuts for the Maker showing fifth, quarter mile and thirty and uh, four fifths, they go racing to the three-eighths mark, off the top turn they come, Woodmere Chipper showing the way by two, Hugo, I go racing second, Kenneco Victory looks set at third, Power Boom fourth up on the outside comes Dusty Lane, Maggie wide in five there goes Provisions to win out Sun and six knots for the maker, and the Woodmere Crunch is terrific. They race past the half mile of mark, going to the five eight one oh one and four by the half. Woodmere Chipper still in command as they drive by the five eight mark. Hugo I go to likes back second. Up on the outside, Dusty Lane and Maggie gaining ground steadily third. Canico victory up along the rail as they get on by the three quarter mile mark. Led by Woodmere Chipper up front. Parked out as Dusty Lane Maggie. Canico victory up along the rail as they race on to the seven eights. One thirty four by the three quarters. Woodmere Chipper the one to catch. Canico victory power boom on the outside. Dusty Lane Maggie racing through the stretch. Canico victory's coming up on the outside. Canico victory to win it. Woodmere Chipper second. It's awfully close for three. Well, Greg, you called it. Canico victory and Jody Hennessy. Uh, Jody Hennessy timing that drive perfectly there with Canico Victory. Uh, Canico Victory, a horse, is known with a, as having a good late kick and used it to full advantage in that race. We're going to take a look now at part one of our feature story on Port Elgin Raceway. We had a chance over the past couple of weeks to uh, visit Port Elgin Raceway and talk to some of the people involved in getting this track underway and had a chance to look at this fine facility. After recording the second largest crowd at a maritime race meet for the 1994 season, Port Elgin Raceway seemed to recapture the magic which has eluded the maritime circuit for almost a decade. And then when uh, this track became on the scene this year, well, I was just elated because I just lived on the road tours two miles down and uh, got my own little barn there, training track, and. Uh, you know, this old horse on a matinee track, he's, uh, he's pretty good. So uh, when I walk in the trail, they say, what do you got that old thing for? And I come to Port Dog, and they say, geez, it's a good old horse. So I feel great over here and just love it. Uh, at a track here, we can bring a colt along real easy. So I, that's what I plan to do. I've got uh, two or three of my own colts now. I can train them here locally, uh, bring them along slowly, 
give them a chance so that uh, if there are stakes material and they can move on. Oh, they're very excited. We got a lot, a lot of support from the community and from people in the community. That's what I'd like to express more than anything else. I couldn't believe the public support that we got. Well, it's myself and I have a partner, Terry Wood. He has a construction company over here and he doesn't own horses himself, but he's just been a long time fan. And uh, we've had this track well, the track's been here for years, and uh, the last 20 or 30 years, I've just used it for my own personal use and uh, more or less trained my own horses here. So with the closure of Moncton uh, about three years ago, we haven't had any place to race in the eastern New Brunswick, So, uh, and it didn't look like anything was forthcoming in, in Moncton to resurrect the harness racing. So uh, I decided to uh, try to get this place on its feet. And uh, when uh, Terry Wood heard about it, he has uh, all his construction machinery, uh, machinery and everything, so he came and wanted to uh, be in partners with me on it, so uh, that's how we started it. Uh, we rebuilt the track, we sent to the USTA and got uh, the plans and specifications for the, that they want for a track, and uh, we went by those. There's six days of uh, surveying in this track to get it right to a T, more or less. The turns are all banked, and it's the way they want it. And uh, then we uh, built a paddock barn and a uh, piece on the existing old barn that was here. And uh, we bought the starting gate from Truro, and, uh, well, we put fences up in the bandstand and ran uh, electricity down the home stretch, and we were going to uh, build a grandstand, and uh, we applied to the USDA for uh, 20 race dates uh, for next year from the 20th of May until the 7th of October and uh, excluding uh, old home week we didn't apply for that date and uh, we were accepted uh, and uh, granted our dates. Frank Daniels and uh, Paul McKinnon both uh, came and looked it over and gave their stamp of uh, approval on it and we were granted our dates and uh, so then we were in con that was the first step and the second step we were contacted agriculture canada and they told us what th they wanted and so then we applied to the maritime uh, racing commission we also uh contacted uh, donnie mcclellan that uh from inverness and he had been working in st john and when that job was terminated we asked him if he'd be interested in coming and uh, running this next year and he came up and he was interested so he came up to spend the week to get all the paperwork in place because everything had to be done by the 30th of October. And uh, anyways, when he called uh, uh, Ted Andrews at the Maritime Racing Commission to set up a meeting to go over and finalize everything, this is one of the first that we were informed that we weren't going to be granted any dates for 95. Well, I think it's a terrible thing. It shows that uh, they're not interested in uh, pr progression or harness racing in the Maritimes when uh, they pull stunts like that. And uh, I'd like to see the thing prosper. And I know we can make it prosper, but you got to have cooperation. You have to spend most of your time uh, arguing or fighting with somebody to, to progress, and it kind of weakens the uh, effort. Well, I was uh, quite surprised to see them turn down because uh, initially when this, this thing got started this summer, it was all to promote the exhibition in this area. And uh, Terry has been talking for the last few years about develop developing this facility into a full-blown racetrack because of the closure of Moncton. So we said, well, okay, let's get ready to do a, uh, uh, an exhibition here in the fall so we thought well the first thing we should do is survey this area and that's what I do for a living so I said okay let's let's get a plan so we got one from USTA and we laid the thing out and uh, and then Terry Wood got involved at that point in time because uh, he saw the, the layout being there and he said well let's let's make a real facility out of this rather than just a, a three horse wide racetrack so uh, this is what he did he got in with his machinery and made the thing well then, of course, we got more and more involved with the success of, of both the, the uh, exhibition races, or the uh, matinee races we had. And uh, so then we decided, okay, let's go for some race dates next year, and, and thought it would be quite successful because of the, the kinds of people we had. As I think somebody in uh, post calls said that we had the second largest uh, uh, audience here for a, for a horse race, just only next to the Gold Cup and Saucer. 
in the Maritimes. And that's, so we thought because of our, our location and the fact that Monkson's closed and the kind of racing we were going to offer with, with being cheaper horses, that it would be really a successful thing. Terry put on a number of races where he had some horsemen over from Alberton and he had them from Bucktoosh and different areas that uh, brought uh, a lot of people from those communities. And uh, I, I see that approach along with the entertainment value as a way to go in terms of promoting new owners in the sport and uh, uh, trying to revive harness racing because we're, we're on the slide backward right now. And the more you cut back, uh, this is not promoting the sport. This is, these, we, we need a facility like this to bring new owners in. And we'll have more on the Port Elgin story a little later on in the program. But first, let's take a look at action from Saturday afternoon at Exhibition Park Raceway in St. John. Race number eight featured an eight-horse field. It was a $1,500 claiming class. The early favorite was the one horse, Dr. Whittaker. Our first chance to see some racing from Exhibition Park Raceway in St. John, and we're glad to have them on board with us here on Stretch Drive. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about these horses uh, right at the moment, but I'm sure we'll get to know them over the coming weeks. But uh, according to the, the morning line, Dr. Whitaker is the favorite going into this race, and another one who is uh, one of the better's choices, number seven, Charlotte's Gold. Now the starter has the horses, race number eight. A field of eight, one Gemini Nukes. Two, Dr. Whitaker. Three, Toot and Tellum. Four, Hoosier General. Five, Viking Jenny. Six, Charlotte's Gold. Seven, Tennessee Jed. The outside eight, KGZ2. Gate is at the head of the stretch, and here they come. They're off and pacing Dr. Whitaker, quickly out to take charge. Gemini Nukes on the inside, racing second. Tennessee Jed leaves from the far outside. And moving in third is Tootin Tellum. Then it's Viking Jenny, Hoosier General, Tennessee Jed. Racing in seventh is Charlotte's Gold, and the trailer is KGZ2. As they go down the backstretch for the opening quarter, Dr. Whitaker goes on to the front. Gemini Nukes has second. Viking Jenny has lost her cover on the outside third. Then it's Tootin Tellum and Tennessee Jed. Racing in sixth is Hoosier General, Charlotte's Gold and KGZ2 by the quarter in 31 seconds flat. Rounding the turn for the three-eighths now with Dr. Whitaker on top. Gemini Nukes gets the garden trip in second. Viking Jenny racing third on the outside, Tootin Tellum fourth. Then it's Tennessee Jed, Hoosier General, Charlotte's Gold and KGZ2 as they come off the turn and race down the stretch for the opening half. On top and cutting it out is Dr. Whitaker. On the outside, that's Viking Jenny. KGZ2 making a bold three-wide move as they go by the half in 103. It's still Dr. Whitaker and Viking Jenny. On the inside, Gemini Nukes has third. KGZ2 is out three wide. Between horses goes Tennessee Jed. Then Tootin Tellum, Charlotte's Golden. The trailer is now Hoosier General. Down the back stretch for the final time and on top. Still with the lead is Dr. Whitaker. Viking Jenny hanging tough second on the outside, and there goes Tennessee Jed, now out three wide. On to the three quarters they go, and looking for racing room is Gemini Nukes. Three quarters in 135. They're starting to bunch up around in that final turn. Dr. Whitaker is the one to catch. On the outside, Viking Jenny digging in, still hanging tough on the outside. Gemini Nukes nailed to the rail in third. Then it's Charlotte's Gold, Tootin Tellum and Tennessee Jed as they come off the top turn and race for home. On top, Dr. Whitaker. Gemini Nuke still no place to go. Tennessee Jed digging in on the outside. Charlotte's Gold as well. Right down to the line. It's going to be Charlotte's Gold to win it. Then it's Tennessee Jed. And looks like Dr. Whitaker for third. Time for that mile. 2.06 and 1. An impressive stretch battle, Greg. Good uh, race right down to the finish there. And... Uh, like we say, glad to have uh, St. John races with us here uh, this evening on Stretch Drive. We'll have another race from St. John coming up later on in the program. We're going to take a look now at race number 12 from Thursday evening at the Charlottetown Driving Park. It featured an eight-horse field. We get another chance here to take a look at Ian Moore's impressive three-year-old colt, Tar Road. Tar Road is an impressive-looking colt, three-year-old son of On the Road again for Ian Moore. Just beat last time out on the off-track, uh, beat a half a length. Should be a little better here today with the better footing. Another one to watch is number one, Dr. Phillips, with the rail post, Gary Chappell driving. Dr. Phillips is a horse when he gets the trip, is usually dangerous in the end, 
and I think with the rail post, uh, we'll be effective in here. Top of the stretch has one Dr. Phillips, two Harowitz, three half goes high home, four kill Karen Jewell, five airborne nymph, six Tarbone, seven outside Kensington Road, Trenning Horse eight, that is model last. Here they come. Pacing, airborne nukes, Turbo get away quickly on the outside. They go battling for the lead as they drive into the first turn. Airborne nukes is showing on top. Turbo is racing second. Kensington Road is showing third. Dr. Phillips comes away fourth. Modulas looks at on fifth. They go to the opening quarter. There goes Turbo up on the outside looking for the lead. He now settles back in up the rail as airborne nukes will take them by the quarter mile mark. Tar Road looks on at second. Kensington Road is racing third. Fourth is Dr. Phillips. From five, moving out is Maldolas. Kill Karen Jewell on the move. In six, half goes High Hope. And your trailer as they swing for the half is Harowitz. Quarter mile and 30 and a one-fifth. They're in front of the stand first time. Getting on by the half mile mark. And a Tar Road sets sail to the top. Halfway home they go. Tar Road is showing the way and opening by three. Kensington Road is outside second. Airborne nukes up the rail, drops back third. Moldo last on the outside and four. Half a mile and 101 and a one fifth. They go to the back stretch, second and final time. All led by Tar Road, being chased by Kensington Road as they race to the three quarter mile mark. Tar Road by two. Kensington Road is second there. There goes Kill Karen Jewel winding up on the outside third. They have an eighth of a mile left to go. One thirty-two and one by the three quarters. Tar Road here comes Kill Karen Jewel winding up on the outside. Tar Road Kill Karen Jewel is flying up on the outside. Kill Karen Jewel is gonna win it. Kill Karen. Oh, Turbo second, up for three, Dr. Phillips. Walter Chivery notching win number 81 in there with Kilcar and Jewel. That's a big win for Walter, too. He's uh, still in the midst of that three-way battle with Lenny Myers and Kenny Arsenault, and there just doesn't seem to be any uh, separating those three as they go right down to the wire here with two weeks left, and it could be a photo finish in that uh, driver's championship. We're going to take a look now at race number 10 on Thursday evening from Truro Raceway. It featured nine horses, very rapid pace field here, Greg. Good looking bunch in here, Lloyd. Uh, nine of them, any one of them could win it uh, looking at the program. Number five, Parkhurst, is uh, coming over from Charlottetown. He's been racing the top class there and has been one of the top pacers on Prince Edward Island in the last few weeks. Comes in here and uh, should be uh, one to watch, I think, in this field. Uh, number one, Richter, I think will be uh, good off the rail. Danny O'Brien driving. Richter has been a winner in two of his last three and I think will be knocking at the door again. And number nine, Lerat Fantasia, a nice little horse, too. Uh, should get a nice trip in here, I think, behind Richter and uh, maybe there at the end. Race number 10 of the evening has Richter, Fowlish Mark, Stoner Eggs Kid, Eureka Bequay, Parkhurst, Harrieter, Scotty J, Riser, and Larat Fantasia. Here they come. They are off and uh, pacing Stoner Eggs Kid off the gate looking for the lead against Richter as they move into the first turn. Richter at the rail. Stone Riggs Kid hustling up on the outside looking for the top spot. In behind them, Larat Fantasia comes away racing third, settling in fourth as they head down the back stretch. That's Parkhurst coming away racing in five at the rail is Fadish Mark. Parked out Harry Eater from six, holding down seven as they race past the quarter is Eureka Bequay from eight. That is Scotty J. And a ninth and uh, trailing the field, that's Riser. 28 and 2. A brisk opening quarter as they make their way by the 3 8s. Richter out front, setting a lively tempo. Leads by one over Stone Riggs Kid. Larat Fantasia on the outside picks up the cover of Stone Riggs Kid. On the inside, racing in four as they approach the half is Parkhurst from five. That's Fallace Mark Harrieter, sixth on the outside, seventh 
is Eureka McQuay Scotty J racing from eight and trailing the field is Riser. They race into the bend on their way to the 5 8 58 and four, the half mile mark. And still with the lead, Richter by one length on the inside. Parkhurst is second. Lorat Fantasia swinging up three wide as they head down the back stretch, approaching three quarters. Richter leads it by half a length on the outside. Lorat Fantasia is in pursuit second. At the rail third, Parkhurst three wide is Harrieter fourth. Four deep is Scotty J into contention five. They race on to the seven eights. Three quarters in one twenty nine and three. Larat Fantasia has taken over the lead on the far outside. That's Scotty J trying to reel him in second on the inside, racing third as they make the final turn. Is Richter Harrieter sits fourth. Here they come through the lane for the final time. Larat Fantasia, Scotty J on the far outside. Scotty J, Larat Fantasia, Scotty J getting up to win it. Second is Larat Fantasia with Harrieter getting the show spot. Scotty J for Dave Pinkney, two minutes and three fifths. That's three of the last four now for Scotty J, a nice racehorse who has picked up his 15th win now on the season, and uh, he sports a mark of 157 and four, taken earlier this year at Toronto Raceway. A nice racehorse who is in top form right now. We're going to take a look now at our weekly driver profile. This week we're featuring Lenny Myers. Lenny Myers, of course, another one of those drivers who's uh, battling. Uh, for the driver championship this year at the CDP. Lenny, of course, winning the driver championship last season, and he's trying to repeat this year, and we're going to have a chance to uh, talk to him now and see how his chances are. I come around, started hanging around with Gary, around Barnes, and end up getting the job. With. Yeah. What year was that? <laughs> uh, it'd be uh, 79 or 80. So how long after that did it take you to go out and get your license yourself? Well, it would, I'd say 10 years or so before I got my license, yeah. She so started at the bottom and worked yeah, out? Yeah, mocker, yeah. yeah <laughs> I'd say core skipper. How fast did you go with him? 58 and 3 here one night. Here at the race, sir? Yeah. What race was it? Just, a Just an overnight event. Well, unfortunately, I didn't get them. It was... It would have been nice to have, but that was the weather. We couldn't do much about that. We tried. Well, we'll not get her this year. Hopefully next year. Well, I do drive to win, yes. That's what it's all about a lot of times, you know. I uh, find you get a horse up front all the time, you're bound to be riding attention all the time, eh? No, that was my first drive. Uh, big. Good month, I guess. I just followed out a few times here and just happened to go to Summerside. I started going up there to drive a little. And took the mare up. She had a good class and she, you know, she went. It's a, it's a good spot to go up. Like the more, the more drives you can get, the sharper you're going to be on the racetrack, right? And around with Gary for a good 10 to 15 years anyway. Doesn't, doesn't hurt your knowledge any, does he? No, no, he's pretty good that way. Uh, how would you rate yourself in comparison to Gary's driving now? You think you're, you think you're getting closer to, you think you're getting closer to the top? Well, I wouldn't say that, no. <laughs> well, I'll just go along and every day and just hopefully we will. Learn, learn something yeah, every day? Yeah, he's getting a little older. I hope it does. It makes it good for you know all the public and everything. Wait and watch it, and makes a lot of exciting around the racetrack. Eh? I hope it goes right down to the wire. So you wouldn't if it comes right down to the last race, the three of you in it. You do you think you have a chance? Well, uh, hard you know, go to shot as anybody winning. Lenny Myers keeping pace in the Drivers' Championship. Yes, it's still a very tight battle. I think any one of those three drivers can win the driver title this year. Lenny has as good a chance as anybody, and uh, we certainly wish him good luck in his pursuit of a second consecutive Drivers' Championship. Let's take a look now at race number six from Saturday afternoon at the Charlottetown Driving Park. It featured a seven-horse field. The number seven entry, Allen's Birthday, coming off three very impressive wins, looks to be the early favorite. 
Alan's birthday will be gunning for his fourth straight win here in this class. Alan's birthday has ruled uh, this bunch the last few weeks. He'll face a stiff challenge, though, I think, from number one, Bub. Uh, with the rail post, uh, will be hard to beat. Uh, Bub should be cutting the early fractions and may be able to take it gate to wire. Another one to watch, number six, Always Hanover. Walter Chevery with the hot hands driving there. Always Hanover has been second uh, the last four times out and will be looking for that big win here this afternoon. Race six, top of the stretch, has one Bub. Two, King James a monster. Three, Power of Gold. Four, Silverwood Diane. Five, Samco Brightstar, six, always Hanover, seven outside is Alan's birthday. Here they come. Saying Bob quickly away at the rail. King James Monster always Hanover up three went on the outside third. Power of Gold comes away in four as they get on by the eighth mark. Bob in command has it by a length and a half. Racing a second is KJ's a monster. Showing third is Power of Gold. Always Hanover takes a spot off the rail in four. Silver with Diana's pacing fifth. Samka Bright Star and Alan's birthday is your trailer. Past the quarter mile mark they go. Racing the far turn first time and Bob is showing the way to the three eighths mark. KJ's monster right there. Second Power of Gold is racing third. Opening quarter in 30 and a one fifth. Off the top turn they come. Bob is showing the way up front. Is the leader of this field as they approach the half mile mark? KJ's monster second. Here comes always Hanover. Moving wide third. Power of gold in four. Sam Gabrangster out there in five. Silver with Diane. And Alan's birthday moving from the back. Past the half mile mark in 102. They race to the 5 8. And Bob continues to be the leader out front. Second is KJ's monster. Always Hanover moving on the outside third. There goes Alan's birthday circling them on the outside Alan's birthday three wide and uh, going to the top he's now opening up on the field Alan's birthday by three now four but Sam go bright stare is giving chase and getting ground quickly on the leader 133 and three by the three quarter mile mark two horse battle shaping up turning for Home. Alan's birthday going for four in a row. Sam Cobright stares giving chase on the outside, but Alan's birthday is responding. Alan's birthday, four in a row. Sam Cobright stares second. KJ's monster for three. Alan's birthday and Gary Chapel using a big last quarter of 29 and one to get the job done in there, Greg. Yes, Lloyd, for the second week, uh, Alan's birthday throwing a big last quarter in there at the rest of the field, and uh, he's uh, been on fire of late. That's win number four in a row now, and we'll see next week if he can uh, make it win number five. Let's cross the water now and go back to Churro Raceway. We're going to set our attentions to race number 10 on Sunday afternoon's card. It was the Olin series for three-year-olds. Bulky field of 10 here, Lloyd. Uh, I like number two, Garvin's Playboy, in from Charlottetown. Uh, this horse has been uh, improving as the year has gone on. A very nice-looking three-year-old run the table colt, owned by Kieran McDonald. I was talking to uh, trainer Wade McDonald earlier in the week, busy making a few changes, and I think he likes his chances in there. Number four, Rollo Bay Fighter, a horse who uh, has moved into the care of Phil Pinckney's stable from uh, the Kenny Arsenal stable last season. He's rounding into form as well, should be a factor. And another one to watch, number eight, Master Cam. He's been a winner of four of his last six darts, and uh, in here, Claire McDonald getting the drive. Master Cam, a nice-looking uh, son of Cam-tastic, should be a factor as well. Mine, Radiant Herod's Master Cam. In the back tier, Bucky's Bullet and Jammer Time. Here they come. They are off and uh, pacing. Rollo Bay Fighter getting the first call from the outside. Radiant Herod's is hustling out. They're five wide into the first turn as they battle for the early lead. Hillview Heather at the rail. Caught on the extreme outside is Radiant Herod's racing second. Rollo Bay Fighter in the center third. Down at the rail, Bucky's Bullet comes away racing fourth. In five as they head past the opening quarter. 
That is Royal Abe, Jammer Time, show sixth, holding down seven. Garavan's Playboy, Arnie's Brandon, racing from eight. Master Cam has nine, and uh, trailing the field is first mine. They battle up front for the lead uh, on the inside, and emerging with the top spot, Rolo Bay Fighter, gathered back to settle in in two as they round the top turn is Radiant Herod's Hillview Heather is next in line, third, looking to the outside, Bucky's Bullet fourth. They move in front of the grandstand opening quarter in a quick 28 and four fifth seconds. They move past the halfway point. Roto Bay Fighter by a length and a half. Radiant Herods is racing second. Outside third is Bucky's Bullet Jammer time fourth. Wide on the outside in five as they dip into the turn. And on to the five eighths is Royal Abe. 59 and two fifth seconds. The halfway point. Continuing on down the back stretch, Roto Bay Fighter a length and a half on Radiant Herod's Bucky's Bullet first up, third Jammer Time within striking range as well, spotted outside, fourth, fifth is Hillview Heather, third over Garvan's Playboy from six, Royal Abe has seven, three wide from eight, now four deep is Master Cam, they race on to the top turn, one thirty and two, the three quarters, it's Roto Bay Fighter still there by one length on the outside, Bucky's Bullet, Radiant Herod's at the rail is racing third, three wide, fourth, that's jammer time. Caught in traffic, Garvan's Playboy in five, off the turn, one thirty and two, the three quarters. They're led home by Roto Bay Fighter. Radiant Herod's moving to the outside. Roto Bay Fighter is holding on to win it. Finishing second, Radiant Herod's Master Cam gets up for the show spot. Phil Pinky and Roto Bay Fighter, a new lifetime record, two minutes and four fifths. Rolla Bay Fighter was very good in that race, uh, parked to that opening quarter, 28 and 4, and uh, was pressured throughout most of the miles, still had enough left in the tank to hold on to win it, and that's a uh, good credit for the uh, up-and-coming sire, Joe G. Hanover there, Rolla Bay Fighter for Phil Pinkney. Let's travel up the highway now to Exhibition Park Raceway in St. John. We're going to take a look at race number 11 on Saturday afternoon's card. It was the first leg of the $1,500 claiming series. The favorite going into this one, number one, Cavallo Sister. This is a mare that was in the care of uh, Leo Peters, an island rainsman there earlier uh, last year. She's been racing very well since uh, going to St. John and looms a large in with this field. They go for a purse of $600. And we have a field of seven. One, Lopez Chip. Two, Cavallo Sister. Three, Casimir Bretts. Four, Party on Garth. Five, Kilcarran Jade. Six, Hillview Jean. The outside seven, that's Fran's kid. Here they come. They're off and pacing. Cavallo's sister quickly bursts to the front. From the outside, Fran's kid is up to challenge. On the inside, Lopez Chip gets away second. Now racing third is Fran's kid on the outside. Party on Garth going fourth. Then racing in fifth is Casimir Bretz. Kilcarran Jade has six, and Hillview Jean trails. Down the backstretch for the opening quarter with Cavallo's sister. Coming to her now on the outside is Fran's kid. Racing in third, Lopez Chip, then party on Garth. Casimir Bretz, Kilcarran Jade, and Hillview Jean there by the quarter in 30 seconds flat. On to the front now goes Fran's kid, and Cavallo's sister has second. Racing in third, Lopez Chip, then it is party on Garth. Kazemi Bretts kill Karen Jade on the outside from sixth, and he'll view Jean as they come off the top turn and race down the stretch for the half. Ferran's kid shows the way. Racing in second, Cavallo's sister. Now third is Lopez Chip, party on Garth to the outside from fourth. Kill Karen Jade. Racing in sixth is Kazemi Bretts, and he'll view Jean there by the half. One minute and two fifth seconds. Rounding that 5 8 turn now with Fran's kid. Cavallo's sister sitting pretty in second. Lopez Chip now a closer third. On the outside from fourth party on Garth. Kill Karen Jade looks to go three wide. And as they go down the back stretch for the final time, Cavallo's sister comes to the outside now to challenge for the top. On the inside, Fran's kid. As they go by the three quarter station, Cavallo's sister on top by a nose. Three quarters, one thirty-two and three. It's Cavallo's sister and Fran's kid. Kilcarran Jade now comes to third and is closing fast on the outside. Just over an eighth of a mile to go and down the stretch they come for home. It's Cavallo's sister on the inside. Fran's kid, Kilcarran Jade making a challenge now, but Cavallo's sister is well in hand. Fran's kid and Kilcarran Jade to the line. 
Three in a row for Cadallo's sister here in the Hold the Line series. And then it's Fran's Kid and Kill Karen Jade for show. The time for the mile, 2.03 and 1. As expected, Cavallo's sister, an easy winner. Cavallo's sister, no problems in with that field, uh, winning by three and a quarter. Going off is the better's choice, and she uh, didn't disappoint there, winning quite easily. Franny's kid, uh, the second place finisher in there, we all know him from uh, the uh, recent Moosehead claiming series that was held here at the Shellatown Driving Park a few weeks back. And an inter interesting side note uh, as well, on Saturday afternoon at EPR, Fredericton reigns been Lonnie Stokes with a very big day, scoring five driving wins. We're going to have a look now at the second part of our feature story on Port Elgin Raceway. Uh, the bit of controversy brewing there, Lloyd, at, at Port Elgin. Uh, the track applied for some racing dates, I believe 20 dates in all, and uh, were turned down by the Maritime Racing Commission when uh, they approached the commission. So we had a chance to talk to both sides and uh, find out just exactly why the track was turned down for these dates. After more than $100,000 of personal investment and the tireless efforts of the entire community, the Port Elgin group were turned down for their proposed racing dates. So we went to the head of the Maritime Harness Racing Commission, Ted Andrews, and asked him why these dates were rejected. There's been a major decline in the paramutual wager, as you know, in the Maritime provinces, and there's no, there's no purpose in diluting that any further with additional racetracks. We've got to try to consolidate and see if we can't get a better format going. But I know when there was Sackville Downs and there was Moncton and there was all the tracks that we have now, they still bet as much money at any one of them tracks. They bet 100000 at Sackville Downs. They bet 100000 at St. John 15 years ago. And we had Truro and Summerside and Charlottetown and all the tracks we have now. So Sackville Downs is gone. Moncton's gone. And the bet never come up none. It went down. The way I see it, they're talking out both sides of their mouth at once. One time they say there's not enough money to wager on the on our racing cards that we put on. Still, the next day they come out with another simulcasting card, and where do they think the money's coming for the bet on that? It's coming from the betters that would bet on the live racing. So to me, I, I totally disagree with that, and I have right from the start. What they want to be able to do is run the horse racing here and uh, have the bills paid. Uh, making money is, is really not uh, paramount on the list. The, what's important is to, at the end of the year, the bill's paid. You have to realize that that's, that's a pretty near impossible situation. We've got small tracks such as Summerside, uh, St. John's struggling, Fredericton is struggling, Inverness is, you know, is, is holding its own, Sydney is struggling, and it just, it's just not realistic because of the low inventory of horses to expect to be able to produce that kind of a format. This summer there was a lot of horses shipped that could pace between 2.5 and 2.7 and 2.8. And they were shipped. I'm certain there was a, a in the area of 125 horses in the Atlantic Canada here that were shipped because of, of couldn't compete in the tracks that we're racing at right now. We have uh, Westmoreland County here, Kent County, and uh, Cumberland County in Nova Scotia, and that's where the majority of the horses were that raced in Moncton. And to my knowledge. Ted Andrews has never done any kind of a personal survey of the horse population in this area. So how he could comment on that, I, I have no idea. But I do know the horse population in this area because I live here and I deal with these people. Well, you have to realize there's a different game between holding a matinee program where you've got aged horses, no controls over what, what is happening with those horses uh, versus running a paramutual program where the Canadian Paramutual Agency is involved. There's, there's all kinds of drug testing, uh, Variable, various uh, concerns relating to the program. So that would become a part of their racing if they did decide to race somewhere given the AC wouldn't? Oh yes, yeah, so this is this has to be part of it for a paramutual meet and uh, it's very expensive to do that and the cost of course would be incurred by the track. I was speaking with a Mr. Morrissey from the Canadian Paramutual Agency and uh, we and I told him that I was uh, really a greenhorn and just starting uh, out learning the uh, ropes concerning uh, drug testing and uh, their input. He said the cost would be one eighth to one percent of your bet and uh, the reason that is is because the the cost calculation is done nationally and uh, Ontario ends up paying the lion's share of the cost. So therefore the maritime tracks are getting away uh, relatively cheap being one eighth to one percent anybody can calculate that out and so based on a ten twenty thirty thousand dollar bet whatever it might be it's still just peanuts when you're talking a large cost the track has got to be upgraded dramatically in order to meet the standards required for paramutual wager now they say they're willing to do that, is that well it's fine it's easy to say but I, I you know it's we're dealing with a serious situation in the harness racing industry and at this point in time 
um, I don't think that they really understand the implications of what, what is required to produce a racetrack. Uh, Frank Daniels was our presiding judge of the day, and he commented afterwards, like uh, at any track, you notice towards the end of the, the day that before the last race or so, the people are filing out and there's hardly anyone left. Everyone stayed here uh, till the last, and, and mainly because they wanted to hear the last selection of the band. But in doing so, they might buy the extra hamburger or place the odd wager or whatever. But you, they were enjoying themselves, and this is the atmosphere you have to have every day. And there's been comments made that, uh, you know, it was a one-day thing, and you can't expect to do it every day. I, I say, why not? If people have a good time and a positive experience, why wouldn't they want to repeat it? That it doesn't seem to be uh, human nature to me that, that, that they would want to repeat a good time. One, one comment that was made to us is that in, anybody can generate a 3,000-person crowd for one day of the year. What, what, what do you have to say? Well, why doesn't anybody do it? We did it, and, and uh, so if it's so easy, let, let, let's see everyone do it, and, and better for the industry if everybody, everybody does. But we'll do it again, I'll guarantee. As it seems to be coming into their pocket, do you not feel that it would be worthwhile? Like if they want to it, doesn't, it doesn't come out of anybody's pocket, but the, but the industry's pocket. When you, you find if you don't uh, have enough paramutual wager to carry the burden, then somebody suffers. And it becomes, it becomes just another problem for the harness racing industry to deal with. My partner and I have both been in business successfully for 30 years, and we don't need a lesson in economics from Ted Andrews. Well, I think the industry needs a, a shot in the arm with a new racetrack, but I don't think a 20-meet uh, card in Port Elgin is the answer. I think if we're looking for a new racetrack, we're looking for a track that could generate a $100,000 per card paramutual wager rather than something in the $15,000 per card range. Well, I think with, uh, with uh, oncoming casinos in uh, Nova Scotia, they'll, they'll have lots of competition to worry about. It won't be our $15,000 tracks. If, if they want a, a track that's going to uh, wager $100,000 a night, I'm afraid when, when these casinos open up that they're proposing that they're going to see a, dr a drastic fall in, in the, the wagers around. So I think they got bigger fish to fry than than our track and worrying about our wager. You know, we haven't closed it out. We simply have assessed the 1995 situation, and if we can get things turned around, then uh, certainly would entertain something in the future. It's a family affair. Uh, when my wife and kids go to the track, they're not as interested in betting or uh, the horses. And uh, last summer when we had the big turnout of 3,000 people, we had the Ellis family band here. It was a family experience and uh, just a tremendous show. Well, we're going to uh, start this uh, spring like we had planned uh, before we were turned down for our dates, and we're going to try to put on a good enough uh, show every Saturday afternoon that we can attract uh, more than average numbers of people that would go, normally go to races and uh, finance our purse pool with uh, the different, uh, uh, well, the admissions and uh, the restaurants and things like that that we'll, uh, you know, the facilities like that. Port Elgin looks like it may be a fairly decent center in the future, Greg. Well, hopefully, Lloyd. Uh, we have a, a bunch of guys here that are really enthusiastic about uh, having a racetrack in the area. There's a lot of support in the community. So hopefully uh, something good will come out of it uh, for these uh, people in Port Elgin. And uh, even though being turned down for those dates, it hasn't seemed to uh, dampen the enthusiasm around the community. And uh, we wish them all the best in their endeavor in the future. Just as a side note on the Port Elgin story, we will be covering some of their uh, race action this February for their Winter Carnival. Yes, we'll be back in Port Elgin in February, and it should be very interesting to see how the track is coming along at that point, and uh, they promise a great time for their uh, Winter Carnival. Let's take a look now at the afternoon feature from Saturday at the Charlottetown Driving Park. It was race number 11, featured a very tight five-horse field. It looked like uh, reggae was going to be a little bit of a layover in here. I think it'll be very much a layover in there. Uh, reggae, a very uh, top-notch racehorse. Uh, again, raced with the best in Atlanta, Canada last summer and won, uh, won impressively on occasion. Uh, gets the five post here today, but I don't think it's going to hurt his chances at all. I think he's going to be an easy winner. The only horse I see providing any kind of challenge, number two, Blazing Finesse. A nice uh, racehorse has been second uh, the last couple of times out and uh, will probably be second or third again today. Race 11, top of the stretch, the Let's Go Travel Pace has won. Dallas Rocks, two Blazing Fellas, three Sunset Colin, four is Traveler, five on the outside is Reggae. Here they come. Fair, fine pace. 
racing. Sunset Colin, quick as to I, is the leader as they drive into the first turn. Sunset Colin, Reggae, moving up on the outside as they get on by the eighth mark. Reggae, stepping to the front and opening by two. Sunset Colin, racing second, showing third is blazing for us, Dallas Rocks. And the traveler is trailing. They arrive at the opening quarter. And Reggae cuts the numbers up front, has it by three, showing second, Sunset Colin, blazing for us, showing third, Dallas Rocks fourth, fifth and trailing as Traveler, 29 seconds flat by the opening quarter, Reggae in command by two, Sunset Colin closing that gap, second, blazing for us, looking at a third, fourth, Dallas Rocks, and the Traveler is trailing, Reggae in command of this field, as they pace on by the half, Reggae by two, Sunset Colin racing second, there goes Blazing Finesse on the outside third, Dallas Rocks fourth, and Traveler is trailing 59 and one by the half mile mark, three eights left to go, Reggae now being chased by Blazing Finesse as they go to the back stretch second and final time Reggae's taking them to the three quarter mile mark Blazing Finesse racing second, there goes Dallas Rocks up on the outside third Sunset Colin and Traveler is trailing the race the far turn final time Reggae is your leader to the seven eights one thirty flat by the three quarters Reggae the one to catch with an eighth of a mile left to go Blazing Finesse is racing second Dallas Rocks on the outside Reggae strong through the lane and Reggae wins it, going away. Dallas Rock second, blazing for this four three. Ian Moore and Reggae making very short work of that field. No surprise in there. Reggae, as expected, was an easy winner. An excellent winning trip, uh, 159 and three. That's an incredible time for this time of year. I believe possibly the fastest time ever at the driving park for that time of year there. And Reggae right back to where he was last summer. Let's check back in with Churro Raceway. We're going to have a look at their feature from Sunday afternoon. It came up in race number 11. West River Diesel got the outside post. Looks like she could be tough again this week. Diesel will be uh, tough again as usual from the 7th post. Uh, I'm waiting on number 6, Happy Family, to come up with that big win, and I think today might be the day. Happy Family's been second and third in his first two starts here. A very class racehorse with uh, over $370,000 on his card, and I look for him with a big race today. Number 5, No Worries, also will be a factor. He's been uh, first and second his last few starts out and has been uh, a strong challenger in with this field. I think he'll be very good again today. Race number 11 has Call Me Fitz, Sir Elmo, Laurent Fantasia, Escort Abe, No Worries, Happy Family, and West River Diesel. They're off and uh, pacing at the rail. Call Me Fitz away looking for the lead. Escort Abe hustling out on the outside. Wide into the turn goes No Worries third. Getting away racing fourth is Sir Elmo, followed out fifth by Laurent Fantasia. Racing away at the rail in sixth is Happy Family. West River Diesel is seventh and treading the field. They move on down the back stretch and on to the opening quarter. A battle up front. Call me Fitz at the rail. Now emerging with the top spot. Gathered back to settle in second is Escort Abe. Away third. That's No Worries. Sir Elmo is pacing out of four. Fifth is Laurent Fantasia. There goes Happy Family to the outside six, and West River Diesel is seventh. The opening quarter in a quick 28 seconds flat. They move off the top turn and approach the half. Call me Fitz, a length and a half lead on escort save on the outside, and getting flushed out first over, no worries, giving cover to Happy Family racing fourth. At the rail in five, past the half is Sir Elmo. Outside in six, West River Diesel in seventh, and trailing is Laurent Fantasia. They race into the lower turn on their way to the 5 eights. Call Me Fitz continues on the front end. 59 seconds, the half. Escort Abe still sitting in the pocket. No worries. First over third. Happy Family getting a good second over trip. Racing out of four and going three wide. West River Diesel follows five. Sir Elmo six and Laurent Fantasia. Down the back stretch and on to three quarters. Escort Abe is getting caught in, moving up on the outside and now matching strides out there. Wide happy family at the rail is no worries. West River Diesel is third. Sir Elmo now fourth. 
Fifth is Call Me Fitz, escorts Abe and Lorette Fantasia. 129 and three, the three quarters. They match drives up front. Happy family and no worries. Stalking those two is West River Diesel, who's now fanning out three wide third. Sir Elmo is fourth. Here they come to the payoff. Happy family, no worries. West River Diesel on the far outside. Happy family, it will be. Happy family winning it by half a length over no worries in West River Diesel. Happy family using a big late move to win the race in 158 and two. That was an excellent horse race. Uh, the three uh, top finishers, though, sort of separated themselves from the rest of the field in there, and uh, I think they have separated themselves from the, the uh, racing competition here. They uh, sort of stand out. Not much to choose between them, but Happy Family got the best of it today. We're going to have a look now at Mike Brown's weekly segment, It's Their Call. This week, Mike is going to explain to us how the uh, classification system works in horse racing, and in particular, he's going to look at uh, the claiming races, which are a big part of uh, harness racing here in Atlanta, Canada. Well, this week, uh, Lloyd, we're going to take a look at the classification or the different races that make up a race card. Uh, the race secretary will post what's called a condition sheet two to three days prior to the draw of a race card. At Charlton Driving Park, we draw on Tuesday for Thursday, Thursday for Saturday, so the race secretary will post his condition sheet or the races he wants to run in that particular card two to three days prior to those dates. The different races at Charlottetown, of course, are stake races in which an owner will pay an entry fee to have their horse eligible to race. Examples of these would be the Atlantic Sire Stake or the Dairy Queen. The majority of races that are run at the Charlottetown Driving Park, especially during the winter meet, are overnight races or condition races. And these races are, the entry to these races are based on money earnings, or example, if uh, you'll notice on the program, he calls for non-winners at 551 last six. And that simply means that if a horse has earned less than $551 his last six starts, then he's eligible for that race. There also will be uh, races uh, programmed for maidens or non-winners of one race, non-winners of one and two races. We'll, he'll call for a class of trotters only. And the, several races will also be up here in the program, and those are claimers. And this is what we're going to try to explain today. Now, exactly what is a claiming race? A claiming race is one in which a horse may start in and may be claimed or bought for a predetermined price in conformance with the rules. Now, the owner of the particular horse classifies his own horse by putting the price on him. If he puts too high a price on, then this horse is not going to be competitive in the class. Or, conversely, if he puts too low a price, then someone may feel it's a good opportunity to buy a horse and they will claim the horse or purchase him out of that race. An example of this would be a 4,000 claimer, for instance. If someone was entered for $4,000, Anyone may claim that horse for the $4,000 price tag, plus allowances. Now, allowances are an adjusted price for certain entries, and they are based on the age of the horse or the sex of the horse. As an example, a two-year-old gets a 100% allowance, so if he was in as a $4,000 claimer, his price tag would be $8,000. A three-year-old has a 50% allowance, a four-year-old 25%, a mare has 20%, and if it's a maritime bred, it has an additional 20%. So just to give you an example, if we had a four-year-old mare racing in a 4,000 claimer, her price tag would be $6,600. Now, who may claim? Any current active member of the United States Trotting Association or the Canadian Trotting Association may claim a horse at the Charlottetown Driving Park, and they must subsequently join the Maritime Racing Commission. Who may not claim? Well, you cannot claim your own horse, obviously. You cannot claim a horse that you train or you drive. You cannot claim more than one horse in a race, and you cannot claim or cause to be claimed uh, or someone to enter a claim for you on behalf of your horse. In other words, a protection claim. Now, how do you go about making a claim or getting to own a horse? Well, you have to put the claim in writing on a prescribed form, and together with the specified amount for that horse, then you enter it into the claim box, which is located in the judge's stand at the Charlton Driving Park. Now, this claim must be deposited at least 15 minutes prior to the scheduled post time of the race in which that horse is competing. Once the word go is given, the uh, horse that you have put your claim in on, then you are now the titled owner of that horse. The, hor the previous owner who entered the horse, though, is still entitled to the purse or any purse money that that horse may win in that race. Now, all monies, as I said, all monies won by that horse go to the previous owner. Now, following the race, we send the horse into the test uh, area for Department of Agriculture to test the horse. The person who makes the claim can go in, check the horse's equipment, measure his hobbles, and take possession of the horse. 
So basically, Lloyd, that is how a claiming system works. Once again, Greg, uh, Mike Brown, a very informative session. That should uh, help folks out there, anybody who uh, maybe is thinking of buying or, or claiming a racehorse. That should give them an idea of the procedure to follow there. And as I said before, claiming races are a very important part of racing here in Atlantic Canada and of our classifying system. So hopefully that will make uh, things a little bit clearer for the folks out there. We hope everybody joins us again next week for our Christmas edition, where we'll feature the Tom McPherson and Jeffrey Bowman story, as well as we'll have Summerside Rainsman Bob McGinnis here for our weekly driver profile. So join us next week here on Stretch Drive. For your comments or story ideas, you can write Stretch Drive at Box 561, Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, C1A7L1. That's Box 561, Charlottetown, PEI, C1A7L1. Or you can call our phone line on race nights at 628-1390. That's 628-1390. Thank you.